I want to praise God for this uh, beautiful Sabbath morning. I have the pleasure of worshiping with my friends and believers from Viara. I want to wish you all God's blessings, grace, and mercy in the loving name of Jesus, our Savior. This is a beautiful Sabbath day, and this Sabbath is very special in Adventist Church as we celebrate the wonders of God's beautiful creation. This Sabbath is celebrated as the creation Sabbath throughout our Adventist Church. But I want to thank the pastors of uh, Viera Century Adventist Church, Brother Vijay and Brother Debashish, for giving me this privilege to share God's message. Before we begin, let us ask God's blessing upon our uh, service this morning. Let us pray. Our merciful, loving, gracious Father, this morning, what a glorious privilege it is ours to come before the throne of grace, to meet with our fellow believers, and to share your message. We thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day that reminds us that you are a God, our creator. And as we worship thee, I invite the Holy Spirit to come into our midst, to present to us, and to make us understand thy word, to see in the beautiful nature around us God's wonderful creation. May this service draw us closer to you and to know you better and to understand you greater. Bless all our uh, friends who join us, who hear thy message, that it may get deep root in their hearts, that they may remain to testify to your glory and worship you today in truth and in spirit. Thank you for this wonderful privilege because we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This Sabbath, as uh, we celebrate the creation Sabbath, it is my desire to help each one of us come to a loving experience and relationship with our Creator God. Many times when people open the Old Testament scripture, they see there a God perhaps who is angry, who is uh, uh, very fierce and wrathful. And so they begin to dislike the God in the Old Testament. But we see in the Holy Scriptures a wonderful loving God and his beautiful character and nature which draws us to himself as our great and loving God. This Sabbath we're going to go through once again God's wonderful character and nature by which we can see him in the beautiful world that is around us. When we look at this beautiful creation, as the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament his handiwork. The nature that is around us all declare God's glory. And we, as God's people, can once again understand his great love for us and we worship him as our God and our creator. But unfortunately, we see in this world today, people in so worshiping God on the Sabbath day that he has prepared, that he has set aside for us, the world is looking to other things, looking to its great scientific methods and scientific understanding, which in many ways is drawing them away from God who is the creator. And so worshiping the creator, they are beginning to worship the created objects. Instead of accepting God as the creator, they look to other forms and other means and other sources as the reason for the creation of this world. And we will study this in our Sabbath school lesson as well. But let us now see God's wonderful creation. As my sermon is titled, In the Beginning, God. Maybe this is the most uh, well-known Bible verse that many people read it, study it, and do deeper studies. And I, as a student of the Old Testament, I have the privilege of always beginning the Bible with Genesis. Any study that I take up, I want to start from Genesis because all things begin in Genesis. And so I invite you to reverently open God's word to the book of Genesis chapter one. Genesis chapter one. Even without opening, we know this verse. This book that talks about many, many beginnings. It starts with these words, in the beginning, God. In this 
first verse, Moses, the writer of Genesis, makes a categorical statement. He makes a declaration that God is right there at the very beginning. If there is a beginning that we're thinking about in Genesis chapter 1. That beginning is with God. It tells us that God is there from the very beginning of this universe. That God is the one with whom all things begin. God is the source of all life on this planet Earth. And so Genesis tells us who God is. In fact, the Bible has as its purpose to tell us who God is. You may many times see on the outside and judge people. Today, I wore this uh, Khadi Kurta to, uh, to join with you in your worship today because I know uh, this uh, service is for uh, God's people in Biara, while many of you may not be from your local state or region. Gujarat, Gujarat is known for what? Two great men, one in the past is Mahatma Gandhi, and he was known for what? Khadi cloth. And I purposely wore this because I want to identify with you people. And of course, we have our present Prime Minister Modi ji, who is also one who follows the, the cultural practice of his state. And uh, wearing this, you are just seeing me perhaps and wondering. What is this uh, Sabbath day? You should come with a tie and suit and all of this. But you know, more than the outward appearance, what I'm wearing should show what I am on the inside. I want to show each one of you that I would like to join with you, that I am one with you, that I have the desire somehow that we all will, in our worship today, be united with our God who is our creator. Knowing God is so important for us as his people knowing for who he is genesis tells us that god is the one with whom all things begin and if you ask the question why did god create any question concerning the nature of god who is god what is god always has as its answer love the bible clearly declares though not very verbally in Genesis, I mean, in the other parts of the Old Testament, but the New Testament tells us what? That God is love. The nature, the character of God is love. And so all activities of God stem from love, which is his very important characteristic. God is love. And therefore, he created this world. Love requires someone whom we love. Love expects a relationship with somebody into, with whom you enter into a loving relationship. And so in order for God to express his love, he plans for the creation of this universe and he brings therein human beings who can love him, who can worship him, who can serve him. Not that God does not have the other planets and universe and other beings who worship him yes but even from this planet earth god wanted to create human beings and today while rest of the world may be enjoying this day carrying on their business and various activities we as adventist christians come together in worship because we recognize that god is the one who we should obey whom we should worship because all things begin with God because he is a loving God. He created you and I. We can voluntarily worship him today. And he tells us this God is the one who is the cause for this whole world and its existence. He says God created. God created the world, the heavens and the earth. This in simple terms is telling us that God is the ruler of this whole universe. This whole world belongs to him because he is the one who created this world. And so on a Sabbath day, when we gather, we specially acknowledge God as our creator, as our creator. This also tells us that creation 
or bringing things into existence is not simply a child's play. It is not simply that happens naturally and automatically. Life and its complexity, as we see in this world today, is so complicated that we cannot really understand anything that you see in the outside world. All that we can see and acknowledge is all, all the wonders that I see around me is all because of a powerful God, only God who can create. You know, it also shows us that God is a powerful being. God has the capacity to bring forth life. He can bring forth new forms of life almost from out of nothing. We wonder, like the great philosopher, what I see is because there is something and not because there is nothing. We see something and therefore we are going to see from where this came and what is this. And so man in the search for God has gone about doing his own way. And by the leading of the evil one, I say, has come to conclusions which take human beings away from God. And so today, if you see science, which is very strongly influenced by atheistic philosophies, philosophy that say that there is no God, say that this world came into existence by themselves, looking to power that they cannot see. But we as God's children acknowledge that by faith, we believe that God created the world. In our scripture reading, as will be as is read to us by faith we know that these worlds were created and formed by god and so we as bible believing christians accept by faith it is god who is the creator of this whole universe the earth and the heavens you know calling these two together at the same time tells us that this world constitutes the planet earth in which we are living and then the rest of the world the heavens in a way tell us that there are vast huge big universes way up in the open expanse heaven and earth one couple but here in genesis heaven and earth refers to this planet earth we are living and the heaven our atmosphere that is in close relation with the earth for us as human beings the first uh, five to ten kilometers of this earth's upper surface is what actually is very important for us within this open expanse we have air that we breathe and the outer layers of this atmosphere has a shielding uh, layer keeping away the harmful rays from the other universal uh, sources of energy so the heaven and earth is one unit in the hebrew language it is a plural were the noun that includes two parts which are and which constitutes one unit and therefore everything on this earth and everything that relates to this earth is all created by god created by god you know many times we as christians think maybe only we christians from the bible know about creation no and almost every religions of this world in every cultures in every uh, uh, different people groups they have a knowledge of creation. They have some form of creation. They do tell us, yes, in their, according to their mythology, according to their history or whatever, they tell us. I'm reminded of a Babylonian story of creation called Anuma Elish. I think my students, Debashish and Vijay and others who studied theology will remember. In archaeology, we study even in Babylon, in Mesopotamia, in Egypt, in China, in various countries of the world, in many states of our country, we have individual different stories about creation. All of this in a way tell us and refer us to a time when there was nothing and then life and other things sprang upon this earth. And so as we see on this earth, God's creation, the Babylonian story tells us that the primordial gods, the original gods were fresh water and salt water. Fresh water and salt water. And likewise, we see 
some parallels to the biblical account. When we see this world before its created primordial form, this earth, the land mass was covered with water. We don't know how deep the surface of the earth, it was so deep that it was dark, as we see in verse 2. And the earth was without form and void. Form and void means simply that there was no living forms of life on this earth. It was void means it was not filled with life forms. But this world existed, this earth existed in the landmass, and above it was, we don't know how many... Uh, meters or kilometers of water that was above it but one thing is darkness was on the face of the deep because of this water that covered the earth light from the outer sources could not enter the earth surface and therefore it was dark the same thing happens if you should go to an ocean bed the deepest ocean bed we have is about seven miles deep in the pacific ocean if you go down deep inside into the water to a certain uh, uh, level you would see light and beyond that it is all total darkness everything was dark on this earth because it was filled and covered with water it was covered with water and then who was present and the spirit of god was hovering over the face of the waters who was present now as creation is about to take place as life is going to begin on this planet earth god is the one who's carrying on this great plan of creating life on this planet earth and who was present god's holy spirit and his presence was there hovering all around the the planet earth and then the agent of creation and who is the one who brought this world into creation it is jesus christ and we have many bible verses john chapter 1 verse 1 to 3 the word who was god the one who created all this world all the planets Likewise, in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2, Christ, the Son of God, a member of the Godhead who became a human being, he was the one who created and formed all the forms of life. And likewise, in Colossians 1, uh, 15 to 17, it tells us this world was brought into existence by Jesus, the Son of God. And therefore, we see creation is an act where all members of the Godhead are actively involved. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so with the plan of these three, we see this wonderful plan of creation taking place. And now, how does it all happen? We see so clearly that creation took place because God had planned this event and wanted to uh, create a planet on which intelligent human beings could live. But this world was in such a condition but as I said, we know from this biblical account that God is powerful. When God speaks, things come into existence. Psalms 36 and 9, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made. He spoke and it was done. God's power has breath. God's breath has power. Likewise, when we, some of us who have some kind of an authority on this earth, when we speak, things happen. When a president makes a decision, it takes place. Likewise, when God spoke, the great God of this universe, when he spoke in split seconds, in a few moments, the whole creation took place. And if you should wonder, you know, why did God need six days or seven days to create this planet Earth? God doesn't really need such time. You know, each day's creation, as you see, the first day, God said, let there be light. It would not take you more than five seconds for God to say these words. And what happened consequently? Light flashed upon this planet Earth, which was dark, covered with water. What is light? Light is a source of energy, power that emanated from a source that brought light to dispel darkness. Light is a form of energy like heat and light that we receive from the sun and other forms of energy, electricity, electromagnetism, and various other things in science we study. But we know very clearly 
the very presence of God brings light. Jesus said what? I am the light of the world. Yes, Jesus is light. There is power with God. And God's presence dispels darkness. Of course, we know darkness is something which is against God, which is contrary to God, and which represents the evil one. And so darkness is dispelled when God comes into the scene. And so the very act of God's planning and God's involvement and bringing life into existence is God's presence. You know, my friends, God's presence makes a difference in this world. It makes a difference in my world, my life, and in your life. We acknowledge that it is God who is the source of all power, the source of all life. And then comes the second day. This planet Earth, which is covered with water, now received light on the first day. And the day is evening and morning. It is a day, evening and morning. Very interestingly, just like as I told you, the dual number, heaven and earth, forming one unit, like was day and night in the Hebrew language, Ha'erev Ha'boker, is one unit, is one unit. This day has 12 hours of darkness, 12 hours of light. Together forms one day. And since creation, this has really been God's organized way of counting days, of dividing a day into dark time and time of the light. And so to this globe, which is round, we can visualize when there is light source, on one side it is light, other side it is darkness. And so on the second day, God separated the waters. The water that is then moved up into the sky, and then the water that remained on the, dry, on the ground. God separated this. Now, when this separation took place between the water in the skies, which we know today as the clouds, and the water which is below as the oceans and rivers and seas, we have the open expanse, the open air, the atmosphere, as it is called, several miles of atmosphere that we have upon Earth. This atmosphere, which is filled with gases like nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and of course, the most importantly, oxygen that is necessary for all living forms. This next day, second day's creation, God created the atmosphere, the open space, which sustains life. Light is the first source of life. And secondly, air, which supports life. And so God, you see, is coming down in beautiful order. And thirdly, we come to the land, which is now covered with water still. And what did God do on the third day? He moved all the water to its place called the ocean. Have you wondered any time I did as a child, going to the riverside or to the seaside, more so in the seaside. And we see the ocean stretching and, and then as far as your eye can go, and see as the water is falling off. Have you wondered why this water which enveloped the earth and why the water in the ocean is not falling off? And if you pour water from an edge of a building or of anything, it just falls off. But what's happening to the water that is covering the earth, that is in the oceans, that is in the rivers? Why isn't this water going off? Science tells us that this earth land mass has magnetic force. And so this magnetic force draws the water to itself. Even moon, which is another uh, uh, plan, uh, uh, yeah, a star uh, where a, a, a land mass is able to attract. And especially during the high, uh, during the seasons in the night, the water is attracted by the moon. And so we know all this phenomenon that the waters are kept in their place because of the force of attraction called gravitation. This laws that God placed so that water will remain on this planet Earth in its own place where God has set. And so on the third day, God moved all the water to form the seas and oceans, and then he created the beautiful 
dry land. And only if you have dry land, you know, life can begin. All plants, all forms of life on this earth, we can bring about because there is dry land. And soon on the dry land, we see what happened. All kinds of vegetation, trees, plants, shrubs, herbs, grass, everything came into existence. And what do these trees and the grass and all these things produce? The green leaves in these plants produce oxygen during the day when they carry on this process called photosynthesis. And this oxygen is so important, necessary for all other forms of life, animals, plants, I mean, uh, human beings and all other creation needs oxygen. And so you see how God is day by day in order, creating things that would be necessary for life on this earth. First with light, second with air and firmament, and thirdly with dry land and food. These trees, these plants, not only produce oxygen, they produce food. For all living creatures that will be created in the next couple of days, animals, plants, human beings and all need plants to produce food. So we see God going about in a systematic manner. But when you see these six days of creation, we see a very beautiful parallel between the first three days of creation and the second three days of creation. First day light, second day firmament, third day dry land and vegetation. On the fourth day, God once again brought into position and place great sources of light for this earth, the sun and the moon and the stars. So the fourth day's creation is parallel to the first day's creation. First day light, fourth day also sources of light. Maybe I will say something uh, which may disturb some of you, but I will tell you, and you can go back and think, and if you have questions, you can ask me. These sources of light were already in existence. Don't be disturbed. Think about it and come back to me if you have questions. These sources of light, sun and the moon and the stars were already in existence before life started on this planet Earth. And if there is no sun, you will not have the solar system because Earth is part of the solar system. All these nine planets or 10 and 12, as I say now, are revolving around the sun. And so sun has to be there. The, the main source of light, heat, and energy to the solar system. And so the sun was there in existence, but it was not visible on this planet Earth because the Earth's surface was covered with water. And so the sun was there, but now once the waters have been cleared and the clouds hanging around in the sky, we have open expanse through which the sunlight could reach this planet Earth. And so this Earth received sunlight and God on this day set the sun to rule the daytime and likewise the moon to rule the night. And then he created the stars also. The Bible tells us he created the stars. Did God create the stars on the fourth day? I would say again, no. They were created, but now on the fourth day, they were able to see the stars in the night. How are you able to see the stars? Why are you able to see the stars? After all, the stars are luminous bodies up in the, up in the sky, in the atmosphere, in the vast expanse of universe. Scientists tell us that light which travels at great speeds is takes about seven and a half minutes to reach from the sun to the planet earth about 186,000 miles per second or three lakh kilometers it takes from sun to reach this planet earth it takes about seven and a half minutes so the sunlight that you get at this woman has started in sun about seven and a half minutes ago but with the stars these are not anyway close by these are long, long distances away, and you don't measure these in kilometers, you measure in what is known as light years. Light year is a distance that 
light travels in one year at the rate of three lakh kilometers per second. It reaches, it is at such great distances. And so the uh, stars, if you are lucky to see tonight, the light that you saw, that you see of the stars has started there years and years ago. And therefore, if stars were created on the fourth day, you would never be able to see them on the fourth day. God placed these sun, moon, and stars with a special purpose. So the first day, the fourth day, the vast expanse of atmosphere and the waters. What did God create on the fifth day? He created birds to fly in this atmosphere, in the skies. And then God created fish to dwell and live and procreate in the waters. So God is filling this atmosphere with birds to fly and the waters with teeming fish. And then to come to the last day, dry land with vegetation. And now we have on the sixth day, animals, insects, creeping things, all kinds of other forms of life. This life forms that exist on the planet Earth, on the surface. And finally, the crowning act of God's creation, human beings. God created the human beings. So different, but yet, along with these animals that God has placed on this planet Earth. So when you see the beautiful creation of God, we understand God is one who does things in a very systematic manner. Light, the cause of all life. Air, which supports life. Food, which sustains life. And light that would continue to let life continue on this planet Earth. The sun every day giving us warmth, sunshine, and light. And then, of course, birds and fish. Beautiful creatures. The best thing I hear every morning is the birds that sing. You know, all around me, I can see beautiful different colors of dreams. All God's creation. And then he created animals. And finally, he creates human beings in a beautiful, systematic manner. Finally, the God, after creating human beings, he gives them wonderful Sabbath. But we can see this beautiful link, this beautiful harmony, this beautiful parallels in the Bible. But what makes human beings so distinct, so different, so superior to all other forms of life? God created human beings, if you see in the book of Genesis, chapter 1. I invite you to turn your Bibles to Genesis, chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. It's about the sun, moon, and light. And then verse 27, 26, 27. And God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion. Or the fish of the sea and or the birds of the air or the cattle every all over the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth god created human beings differently from other forms when god spoke other forms of life came into existence where did they come from by the way where did they come from you know god's creation is called in the latin language as ex nihilo creating out of nothing god does not need anything to create something because he is the source of all power when he speaks his breath has power that brings forth life even out of nothing as he created this world but these other forms of life verse 19 of genesis chapter 2 in genesis 2 we have once more a creation account but with special focus and special information it has out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the air, and he put them to see what he would say and call them. Likewise, when he said the trees came out of the ground, the animals and the birds, all of this came. And in creating man, what did God do? Chapter 2, verse uh, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground 
and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. God made man once again with the same dust from where the animals came from, from where the birds came from, from where the trees sprang out. And likewise, when we human beings die, where will we go? We go back to the ground because it is from the ground, from the dust that God has taken us. But he breathed breath of life into human beings. Likewise, all other forms of life also has the breath of life. There is no difference. There is no difference between animals and plants. We all are taken from the ground. We all receive the breath of life from God. But what's the difference? What is the difference? We human beings are made in God's image, in his likeness. We bear a resemblance to God. We look like God. We look like God. Oh, by the way, I forgot Eve. God creates Eve. And where did God create Eve from? God created Eve from Adam. Adam is now the source for Eve's creation. Adam was taken out of the ground, so therefore Eve also has, of course, uh, the elements of the, the dust and the ground uh, that she derived from Adam. So Adam and Eve, in a way, are actually one unit. Ha Isha, Ish Isha, Adam, woman, and man. Man and woman are one unit. Woman is taken out of man. And when Eve was created and brought to Adam, see here in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, uh, verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in his plates. God took a rib from the side, from Adam's side. Some of you men who are there, uh, please feel your ribs. There must be one or two missing, I suppose. Are you finding? Please find your ribs. You will find one or two missing. You know why? Because we as children of Adam, we also have what is missing. Uh, because from there, God made Eve. And after he made Eve, verse 22, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made a woman and he brought her to man. After creating Eve from the rib of Adam, God brought Eve to Adam. And Adam said, verse 23, this is now bone of my bone. How did Adam know? How did Adam know that this is now flesh of my flesh? Did God give him a lesson in anatomy and physiology and in the creation of Eve? But Adam, when he saw Eve, he saw her just like himself. When God saw Eve, Adam saw Eve, she was just like him because she was taken out of him. Well, she's a woman, of course, no doubt. But Eve was just like Adam because she was taken out of Adam. Likewise, when God made Adam in his own image, Adam looked exactly like God. He looked like God. Physically, he had a structure and a form that God has. And so when we see a human being with a form and structure, we understand God is also a being who is existing with a form, a nature which we know, of course, is divine. Our nature is human, but God's nature is divine. But he has a form. He is a being. He is one who has emotions. Likewise, mentally, physically, and spiritually, we are made like God. Mentally, God gave Adam and Eve the capacity to think, to reason, and to make decisions. This is very important capacity that God gave to Adam and Eve. To think, to reason, and to make decisions. And therefore, we see, we come to this such a wonderful God who has created. And spiritually, to have a relationship, God made Adam and Eve to have a spiritual relationship with one another and with God. And now you understand why God gave Sabbath. A day when we can stop from all our physical labor 
had made with God and enter into the spiritual relationship, into a spiritual relationship, joining with our family in worship to God. Many times we fail to worship God because we do not have a relationship with him. But on Sabbath, we enter into this relationship, acknowledging God is our creator. But we know science tells us human beings are like animals. Yes, we are like animals physically, biologically. Our structures, our systems, everything else within our uh, human body is very similar to animals. But how are we different? Animals have a mind too, they think, but not like us as human beings to make decisions and to recognize God as a creator and to worship. Animals do not have this power to recognize God as a creator and to worship God. You know, sometimes maybe I've seen people and their dogs coming into the church. You think those dogs came to church to worship? Oh no, maybe because the church is more cooler and more cleaner than perhaps many other places. But no, these animals don't come there to worship. Some people think, well, you know, the birds flying around are, you know, making a lot of noise and they're uh, doing their uh, natural sounds. Well, we think they may be glorifying God. We can say, but it is not again. They have no consciousness of worship. But we human beings are especially who are made in his image. We worship God willingly, voluntarily, out of of our own free will. This makes us different from human beings, other, other forms, forms of life. Animals don't worship God. Animals don't have a relationship. Well, you know, physical relationship they may have with uh, their family or spouses, but we human beings bear that resemblance to God and we worship God because we acknowledge Him as a creator. On this Sabbath, we have come here today to worship God because Sabbath is a sign and a time to remember God. Sabbath is not just time. It is a relationship, an experience with God. Sabbath is one which God gave us to remind us that he is a great, all-powerful God, the one who loves each one of us, the one who also tries to maintain that loving relationship with us. But Sabbath is again a time when we shall be restored because of sin, that relationship with God has been change has been marred and we as god's people yes we'll have to be restored and today we'll study your sabbath school lesson how the purpose of education is to restore in human beings the image of our creator that is the purpose why we have creation and redemption education and redemption to restore in man, to bring back man who have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, to be brought back into that loving relationship with God. And so Sabbath is a time for this wonderful experience. And as you worship God this Sabbath, as you remember God as the creator, as you look at this world to see the marvels and the splendor and the beautiful design, we know that there is a designer. Problem is many times we don't use the right glasses. We believe science, scientific theories, scientific uh, methods and modalities, and these humanistic inventions have been misguided by the evil one. And so they look at the world and say, well, things came into existence all by themselves. What a denial of the great truth that God is the creator. If you don't acknowledge God as the creator, this life on this earth has no meaning. Your life and my life has meaning because we acknowledge God as the great creator. And so on this creation Sabbath, once again, I want to remind you, I want to assure you, we are God's creation. God is in the work of recreating this planet earth, recreating this world for each one of us so that we can be brought back to that loving relationship that was lost because of sin. This is chapter 3. God has a promise. He will restore us by sending his son Jesus to die, to, uh, to bruise the head of the serpent, to bring to an end the power and rule of Satan. And soon 
that wonderful restored planet will be recreated and we will have that wonderful privilege. We have started in Genesis. We have come to the end of Revelation chapter 21, 22. When this world will be recreated, when sin will be completely annihilated, destroyed, and we shall enjoy once again that loving relationship with God when we shall be in heaven with him for the thousand years and return back to this earth, recreated, beautiful, and harmonious as it was for sin. This is the wonderful plan that Sabbath is reminding us every day. God is a creator and he is our redeemer. If I had more time, I would have gone into the Ten Commandments to show you. Ten Commandments reminds us how God is restoring us and therefore we keep the Sabbath because it is God who saved us from our sins and set us in right relationship with God with our sins forgiven. May God bless you on the Sabbath as you worship God when you think of him in spirit and in truth. You believe it is God who created us and it is God who is recreating us. Let us cooperate with him and let him finish the work that he has started in us so that we can be ready for his kingdom. May God bless you and have a wonderful Sabbath. God bless you. Amen. Excuse me, sir. Can you please pray for us? Worship God as we close ourselves with prayer. Our loving, eternal, wonderful Father. What a blessing it is for us to be called into your presence, to worship you on this beautiful Sabbath. This Sabbath that you have created from the very beginning on the seventh day. And we, following this creation model, we continue to remain faithful to you, and especially in the last days, when this Sabbath shall be put to test, when the Sabbath shall be denied by the evil one, and the rest of the world follows the false day of worship, which is not the seventh day Sabbath. But keep us faithful to the Lord as your people, that we can worship you and continue to serve you. Bless us today in all our worship. We acknowledge thee as our God, creator, and our redeemer. Keep us faithful to thee till the day when Jesus shall come and we shall be restored back into that wonderful relationship with you, starting even here and right now. I pray for especially the church in Viara. May your blessing be upon every member. Bless the pastors and the school and the administration and their services in this community. Keep them on your loving care. And may the school continue to be like a light shining that many may see your good works and glorify you. Keep us faithful to thee and bless us in our ministry on the Sabbath. We pray all this blessing in the loving name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the ever-abiding presence of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sabbath.